peripheral vascular disease is plaque buildup in any blood vessel outside of the heart. That includes head, arm, abdomen, kidneys, legs, you name it. Plaque is plaque, whether it's in the heart or anywhere else in the body. Okay? Plaque is also called atherosclerosis. It's a term that stands for fatty deposits in the arterial walls. This is just another picture of a normal artery blood flow and an atherosclerotic artery. When the plaque builds up in the artery, you get decreased blood flow. So wherever that blood flow is going gets less and less blood, whether that's in your heart or in your legs or in your brain. For today's purposes, we'll focus mostly on the legs, but it can really affect any organ. Anyone over the age of 50 is at risk for this. Anyone who smokes, anyone who has risk factors such as high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, anybody with a history of heart disease or stroke, anybody who's African American. We think that 18 million people have uh, PAD. It's a vastly, vastly underdiagnosed disease. And the problem with this is that half of these 18 million people have no symptoms at all. So the people, you, you'll read, I think you may have read on the internet or, or even my website, it said 8 to 12 million people have this. 8 to 12 million people have been found to have it, but there's another 8 to 12 potentially that have it and don't even know. The main things to look out for are claudication. Claudication comes from the Latin word meaning to limp. Uh, and what it means is it's a sign for a lack of blood flow in an organ. So usually the classic example of claudication is pain in your calf while walking or walking in a straight line or walking upstairs that's usually relieved at rest. What does that mean? Well if I have a blockage in my leg and I'm resting I probably have enough blood flow to my foot to keep it warm and to keep it without pain. But what happens when I start walking? When I start walking, I need more blood flow to those muscles in the legs to help me walk. And if I have a blockage there, then that blood flow is not going to make it down to my foot and I might get some cramps. If the blockage is up here, I'm going to have cramps down to, downstream from that blockage because the blood flows down. If the blockage is up here in my belly, I may have pain in my butt, pain in my thigh, and pain in my calves. So that pain when you're walking that goes away with rest is a sign that you need to get looked at or you, you might have PAD. Also, pain in the legs and the feet that disturb sleep. A lot of times patients get pain at night when they go to sleep and that could be a sign for poor circulation. It could be other things and we'll talk about what those other things may be as this talk goes on but it's also something that you should make note of. Wounds or sores on the toes and feet that heal really slowly or don't heal at all. If, you're, if you got a cut on your toe and it doesn't heal, that may be a sign that there's not enough blood flow going there to help that tissue heal. Weak or absent pulses in the legs also. And pale or blue discoloration. Some other symptoms include a temperature change. If one leg is colder than the other, that could be a sign that one leg's not getting blood flow. Poor nail growth. If, you're, if your nails are not growing well, that could be a sign of, of poor circulation as well. Other things that cause poor nail growth are diabetes. Decreased hair, again, that goes along the line. If you're not getting blood flow down there, your hair, is not gonna, your hair follicles aren't gonna grow well. A lot of people can have really shiny skin in their, around their ankles or, or toes. Erectile dysfunction. You've heard this. All the, all the gentlemen here have heard this as well. Uh, anyone who's seen a urologist, I get lots of patients who are referred from urologists because they see their urologist and tell the urologist they have erectile dysfunction. They send them to the cardiologist because erectile dysfunction could mean you have a lack of blood flow in those areas. And that lack of blood flow could be from blockages in the pelvic area, abdomen, and even legs. When we talk about plaque buildup and blockages, if you have it in one area, you could easily have it in another area. This is one of the scans that we're talking about. A simple test called an ABI, an ankle brachial index. Okay? What that is, roughly, is a measurement of the blood pressure in your ankle versus the blood pressure in your brachial artery or your arm. Okay? The thinking is the blood pressure in your 
legs should be equal to the blood pressure in your arms, okay? It's just one over the other. A normal one is one, okay? It's a simple test that can be done inside the office. It usually takes about 15 or 20 minutes, and it just involves putting blood pressure cuffs around your legs and arms and maybe listening for a pulse. If that test is abnormal, we usually order more specific tests. One of those more specific tests is an ultrasound. An ultrasound is another simple procedure where we use non-invasive ways to measure blood flow through high, frequently, high frequency sound waves that go against red blood cells, okay? This little color thing here is just like the Doppler on the, on the weather when you're listening to the news. It tells us which way the blood is flowing and what direction it's going in. We can also put a line right there and it can measure the velocity of that. Not only that, we can see an outline of the vessel and oftentimes we can see whether there's plaque there. So it gives us a lot of really good information. Another study we can do that's a little more specific is something called an MRA. An MRA is just like an MRI, magnetic resonance angiogram instead of imaging. It uses magnetic and radio waves to basically outline the blood vessels and we get some really, really good pictures. CT. CT scans have gotten really, really good and we actually have a CT scanner that uses the least amount of radiation in the entire city and it can do CT scans in about 30 seconds. And these pictures are amazing. These pictures are able to reconstruct blood vessels in our body and three-dimensionally reconstruct them. And as a physician, it's very helpful because I can look at these up and down, I can turn them left and right, and when I have to do something, I can know exactly what I need to do, how I need to do it, and where I need to come from to get to these areas. So again, we're just talking about more specific testing. If we want to get more specific, we do things called angiogram. The first picture I showed you for that patient when we started talking about it. An angiogram is a really simple procedure where we put a small plastic tube in the groin and through that groin we navigate through the arteries in the body and put selective catheters in the body and inject dye to take pictures of the arteries. If you are diagnosed with severe PAD, not any PAD, severe PAD, your chance of being alive after five years, uh, your chance of dying, excuse me, after five years was 30 percent, okay? They compare that to stroke, coronary artery disease, and breast cancer, meaning people with severe peripheral vascular disease have a higher chance of dying after five years than people with breast cancer, than people with heart disease, people with stroke. It's pretty close to people with colon cancer. So if that doesn't open your eyes, I don't know what does. This is something that's a serious disease, and, and I go around and give lots of talks and try to get regular primary care physicians to screen for this, be aware of this. And I'm glad all you guys came here tonight because it is just as important as cancer, heart disease, and stroke. If you have a diagnosis of peripheral artery disease, it increases your chance of heart attack and stroke. Most of these people don't lose their legs or get an amputation. They end up dying of heart attack and stroke. You can also get leg cramps, ulcerations, and amputations. But the cardiovascular events are more common than the leg, than the other, uh, the leg events in these, in these patients. It's lifestyle changes, okay? It's eating the right foods, exercising, and taking control of the risk factors. Smoking, we need to stop. Blood pressure, we like the blood pressure but less than 130 over 85. Cholesterol, your LDL is one of the bad parts of your cholesterol. It's the low density lipoprotein. Low, you want it low. That's how I remember it. That's what I tell my patients. You want an LDL below 100, preferably. You want to monitor your blood sugar. Have your physician, have your doctor check your blood sugar periodically fasting and prevent diabetes if you don't already have it. And exercise. Exercise is probably one of the main treatments for this. And I like to tell patients to walk 10,000 steps a day. I know that's a lot, but if you can aim for that, it's roughly about five to seven miles a day. Any male over the age of 45, especially Caucasian males, an aspirin a day 
81 milligrams, the cheapest kind you can get, will reduce your risk of heart attack and stroke by 33%, by one third. Okay, so if you guys in here, everybody looks like they're over 45, I hope I don't get in trouble. You need to be on a baby aspirin every day, as long as you don't have a bleeding problem or an ulcer. In women, that's not as backed up because most of the studies we've done in the past, unfortunately, are on white men. That's just how it is. Women tend to be an enigma. They bleed more, so they don't go out and say, if you're over 45, you need an aspirin. What I usually tell women is if they have risk factors, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, smoking, any of these things, a strong family history, then they may benefit from a baby aspirin as long as they don't have any history of stomach ulcers or bleeding. Blood pressure medications, okay? We have several medications out there that you can talk to with your doctor that will help get to that blood pressure. And it's more important getting that blood pressure to below 130 over 85. Cholesterol medications, these medications are wonderful. They're called statins. There's several statins out there and they really, not only do they lower cholesterol, but they have what we call pleiotropic effects. These are effects beyond their cholesterol lowering properties. They actually can stabilize plaque and they've been shown to prevent or reduce the risk of a heart attack or stroke. So, if I get a patient for some reason that has a normal cholesterol, but I find plaque in their body, whether it's in their neck or heart or in their legs, they get a statin, they get a cholesterol pill. Okay, not for their cholesterol, but for the other good effects that these medications have. If all of that is done and you still have pain, claudication, you're limited with your lifestyle that you can't go across the street to get your meal, you can't run to chase your grandkids, you can't walk two blocks, then we talk about other options, which include endovascular, which just means procedures within arteries or veins, or surgical. The angioplasty is a term in which a wire is passed through a tiny hole in the artery, past the blockage, a balloon is then taken over that wire and inflated to sort of mash up plaque up against the wall. The balloon's inflated and removed. What used to happen before there were stents, they were just balloons. And we would balloon these arteries and a few hours later, a few weeks later, the artery would recoil because they're elastic, almost like rubber. So you would mash the plaque up against the wall and open the artery and several hours later, days later, that artery would close again. Stents were then discovered and what a stent is, it's a metal scaffold, it's like a fence. So we balloon that artery and then we leave a stent behind and that stent stays and keeps that artery open. I don't want to be completely biased since I'm an endovascular guy, I do all my procedures through a tiny hole, I wanted to tell you about surgery. <laughs> because what I tell my patients is, if we can't do anything with stents or these procedures, at the end of the road, you can always get surgery. I think of it as a last resort. Because the techniques and the technology is so good these days, we're able to do a lot of procedures through really small holes in the arteries. It's sort of eliminated or gone away from major operations and major surgeries. This is basically what happens when you have a blockage in the distal aorta, is you get a bypass. You get a big surgical incision in your belly versus a tiny hole in your groin. You get a plug from above to below. That's exactly what a bypass is and that's what a bypass looks like in the operating room versus an angiogram, which is a small plastic tube in your groin. We even do them from the wrist. These are questions you can ask your doctor. Does my medical history raise my risk for peripheral artery disease? Which screening tests or exams are right for me? If I have PAD, what steps should I take to treat it? Will PAD increase my risk for other conditions? And you guys know the answers to these questions at this point.